Hey everyone, um, this is the workshop for um, package development in Julia in VS Code. Um, my name is Sebastian. I'm unfortunately going to be doing this workshop alone. David won't be able to join us, I don't think. He might be able to drop in a bit later to help answer questions and so on. But um, for now, it's just me you'll have to settle with. Um, I'm going to be monitoring Pigeonhole and uh, the YouTube comments a bit. Um, so feel free to ask questions whenever possible. Uh, the pigeonhole link is going to be at the bottom of the um, videos for a while. I'll just um, pop that in and out as necessary. Uh, it's probably going to be fairly easy to remember, right? <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, as always, ask all the questions you can. Um, I'm more than happy to answer the, uh, them, and I'd love for this to be a very interactive workshop, uh, which might be a bit harder because um, it's going to be remote, right? <laughs> uh, just like all of JuliaCon, but still. Um, okay, so what's on the agenda for today? Um, I'll briefly go over what's VS Code and why you should or might want to use it. Um, also about uh, how the Julia extension works and a bit about the history of the Julia extension. Um, we'll set up uh, VS Code and the extension together, or at least I'll describe how to do that. And um, then I'll cover multiple topics of package development. Um, among those, um, how pack packages are structured how you write and evaluate code in VS Code, um, how VS Code integrates with Julia, so how you can leverage several of the more advanced features of the extension from your own package code, for example. Then a fairly big topic is the debugger. You might be um, yeah, familiar with the various efforts for writing good debuggers in Julia. And um, yeah. Those were usually met with mixed success. Um, but yeah, I'll just cover a few tips and tricks basically to get um, decent performance out of out of the debugger. Um, another topic is profiling. So VS Code and the extension have uh, built in support for those. I'll just showcase them. And last but not least, um, we'll write our own small package. So you can basically take a look at the package development workflow from start to finish. Um, I'll then also show off a few more cool features that are a bit more situational, but you might be interested in nevertheless. For example, if you're mainly develop developing on uh, remote machines, then you might be interested in persistent sessions for Julia and a bunch of um, other things. Uh, then at the end, if there's still a bit of time, um, I'll cover a bit of the internals. So basically take a deep dive into the implementation of the extension, mostly the backend, I suppose, because the front end code isn't particularly relevant and also it's not um, really Julia code, so whatever. Um, and I can also cover a bit about or talk a bit about um, how other editors might be able to leverage the same code because of the design of the extension. <clears throat> so let's um, get going. What's VS Code? Why would you use it? Um, VS Code, which you can see on the screen here. Uh, by the way, I hope the font size is um, big enough so you can read everything. If not, then please do let me know. Um, I'd prefer not to increase the font size too much because um, we'll need the screen real estate to show the various UI elements that the extension adds. And it's very hard to um, develop properly if you can only see a few lines of code and have a rebel open and have plot pane open and so on and so forth. If it's a big issue, then do let me know and I'll increase it a bit more. But for now, I'd prefer to keep it this way. Anyways, so VS Code is an Electron-based IDE. Um, Electron is a framework for developing um, programs for your desktop, basically. It's based on Chromium, which is also the um, JavaScript 
web engine that Chrome runs on. So that definitely has advantages and disadvantages. Um, many people complain that VS Code is slow. Personally, I don't see any big issues with it, um, but your mileage may vary as always. It's also developed by Microsoft, so there's substantial um, manpower behind the development of the um, whole program. And um, at least in spirit, it's a bit of a successor to Atom. Atom is another Electron-based editor, or IDE, um, which has been released many years uh, before VS Code, but um, has also died basically around the same time that uh, VS Code, uh, VS Code's popular popularity rose. Uh, you can still use Atom for developing uh, Julia code <clears throat> with a, a Julia extension, which um, was originally started by Mike Innes, and then I kind of took over development of that. Um, so this is what that looks like. Um, currently, development of Juno um, has been stopped mostly. We're only implementing critical bug fixes. And the whole team behind Juno, which is basically me and uh, Shuhai. OK, increase font size. OK, sure. Um, yeah, um, have uh, moved on to VS Code and joined forces with uh, the people behind the VS Code extension, uh, Julia extension for VS Code, uh, which are David Antoff and uh, Zach Nugent. Um, yeah, David unfortunately couldn't make it here today, as I said before. Um, okay. Font size is this better? Big enough? Let me know. <clears throat> right. Um, as I said, we've joined the um, VS Code or the, the team behind the VS Code extension around two years back. And since then, most development effort in the um, IDE and tooling space, I guess, uh, for Julia has been focused on, on VS Code or on the back end that powers the VS Code extension. Um, as I've already kind of alluded to, that back end is reusable. At the same time that Microsoft developed uh, VS Code, they've also um, implemented a protocol for specifying uh, communication between editor front ends and language back ends. Um, that's called the Language Server Protocol, or LSP. And um, many features in the VS Code extension are powered by that. Other editors can serve as um, the client for the language server that's written in Julia. So um, yeah, I'll maybe show that off at the end of the talk or workshop rather. Uh, but um, the work we are doing for the extension, at least the backend work or server work we are doing for the extension, is not very or not at all specific to VS Code, basically. Okay, um, let's get into setting up VS Code. You can download VS Code from code.visualstudio.com, and yeah, let's download it here. Um, it might make more sense if you're on Linux uh, to just use your um, distros package manager itself. Do take care that there are multiple builds of VS Code out there. A popular one is VS Codium, which basically um, removes all uh, Microsoft licensing from the editor. So VS Code is open source, but there are certain um, restrictions on the usage of some extensions that are also developed by Microsoft. Most importantly, the various remote editing extensions, but I'll show those off later as well. OK, so um, if you want to install VS Code, just do that from here. You can also follow along the um, talk on Julia Hub. Uh, Julia Hub is a uh, to a computing offering, and you can create an account, log in, and then start um, a VS Code instance in the cloud, basically. 
So I'll just do that here just to show off how, how that looks. It's going to take a few minutes to uh, spin up an instance for us, mm, but we'll come back to it later. If you um, haven't used Julia Hub before, um, it's at juliahub.com and um, you get a $25 of free credits initially. Uh, VS Code instance is very cheap, so it takes, um, what's it, 17 cents an hour um, on the cheapest tier. Uh, so feel free to spin up an instance there and give it a go. Okay, um, once you've started VS Code, you will be met with an empty window. Somewhat like this. Um, and on the left-hand side here, you will see a bunch of icons. The one we are most interested in right now is the extensions icon. You can also, as the pop-up says, use the Control Shift X shortcut to open the um, extensions sidebar here. And um, for now, it's enough to just type in Julia and install the Julia extension for VS Code. You could also install the Julia Insiders version, uh, but that one is prone to breaking at certain times. So um, for productive work, I mostly recommend uh, the normal Julia ex or, yeah, the normal Julia extension. <clears throat> uh, once you've installed it, it should work fine. You might get a pop-up in the lower right that prompts you to restart VS Code. If so, just just do that. <clears throat> okay, that's basically it. Um, if you don't have Julia installed, you'll also need to do that. Um, I'm sure most of you are already familiar with Julia. That's why you're here. Um, installing Julia is as simple as going to julialang.org, um, clicking download and downloading the appropriate release for your platform. Uh, for Windows and Mac, uh, there's an installer and that installer will install Julia in a very predictable location. So in that case, the extension will pick it up from that path. Uh, you shouldn't need to do anything at all. And um, if you're on Linux, then you just get a tarball. Um, so you'll need to either make sure that the Julia binary inside of that tarball is on your path once you start VS Code, or you will need to um, change a setting, which I'll show off right now. Um, the setting is in, um, if you go to, uh, um, let's, hold off on, let's hold off on that for a second. I'll just um, describe how you would interact with VS Code in general and then you can probably find the setting yourself, but I'll also show off how to how to get there, right? Um, if you're familiar with Atom and Sublime Text, then the main mode of interaction with VS Code is probably already familiar with um, for you. And that's the so-called command palette. Um, you can open it with either F1 or Control Shift P or maybe Command Shift P on um, Macs. I'm not entirely sure. Um, and yeah. That brings up this um, little pop-up window, and you can just search for various um, commands here. If you're interested in what the Julia extension offers, you can just type in Julia and see which uh, commands we define for you. But since we are talking about settings, let's just type that in. And then there's this preferences open user settings uh, option. And if you use that, you will um, get an overview of uh, <laughs> all the different settings that VS Code provides for you. Um, there are a lot. Um, the ones I find, or yeah, the ones that are probably most 
uh, useful for you are um, right now the type in Julia, then you know you get all the Julia settings. And the one we're interested in right now is Julia path. So um, this one defaults to just Julia. Um, if you leave it empty, then we just assume that Julia is on your path and we'll use that executable for starting Julia. Um, my Julia executable is called J1, um, which is basically just a remnant from the time where we were you know, pre 1.0 release and I had J6 and J7 and J1. Um, but yeah, J1 is basically just um, yeah, 1.62 for me right now. Um, so if you're on Linux, you might need to change the setting to point to wherever you've just extract, extracted um, the Julia tabball. If you're on any other OS, then don't worry about it at all, unless you've used a um, custom path for installing Julia. So um, what else does VS Code offer? Um, you can start a terminal inside of VS Code. To do that, you can, of course, open the command palette and type in terminal. And the one we want here is, well, actually new terminal is, um, great new integrated terminal is a command we are looking for. Um, you can do that and this will pop up this um, lower pane here, which has a bunch of different options. Uh, one of them is the terminal. And um, if you want to open another one, you can use the plus button here. If you want to delete this one, use the trash can, and you can also split terminals if you so desire. So there are a bunch of options here. You can also start um, different kinds of shells in here, depending on your operating system, this will look different, but I could, for example, also start a Tmux session from here. Um, I want it. Um, Okay, then on the left-hand side, you see a bunch of icons. I've already covered the extensions um, icon and panel here. Um, VS Code also you know, recommends a bunch of extensions here. Uh, you might or might not want to install any of these. I have a few suggestions for extensions that uh, you might find useful. Among those are uh, GitLens. GitLens is a... Um, enhancement to the built-in Git capabilities in VS Code. So if you found, uh, find these wanting, then feel free to try GitLens. VS Code PDF is an extension for viewing PDFs in VS Code, which can be very useful if you don't want to switch between different windows and just want to have a tab that well, contains a PDF, right? Uh, the various remote extensions I've already talked about a little bit. And I can very much recommend people install them, at least if you are using the official VS Code build. So do give it a go. Um, you can connect via SSH to remote servers. You can use the Windows subsystem for Linux if you're running Windows. And this will basically give you a very Linux-like and development environment inside of Windows. So in theory, you wouldn't have to interact with any Windows um, yeah, terminals or file systems at all in that case. Uh, you can also use uh, this um, remote container extension, which allows you to just um, develop inside of a Docker container, for example. And if you're a fan of Vim, then you might uh, want to install one of the various uh, Vim um, extensions for VS Code, either Vim or I think new Vim it's called, it's called new Vim, um, which uh, allow you to use your, well, the original key bindings you, you know, are used to from Vim. I'm not going to use this for, for this tutorial. Um, other important settings you might want to take a look at are the um, Julia execution result type thing, uh, setting. Um, you can just type in Julia and result and that'll bring up the setting. 
For this tutorial, I've set it to inline errors in REPL, but feel free to choose any of these options. The default is just REPL, um, which means um, if you evaluate code in the editor inline, then it'll only show up in the REPL. Inline errors in REPL is what I like most. Um, try all the options and see what you like once we get to the code execution um, part. I can also very much recommend setting the font family inside of the editor to Julia Mono. Um, Julia Mono is a font that has a very, very wide Unicode coverage. So um, oops. Uh, so I can very um, heavily recommend you using it. It's also made by Comolion, who's also responsible for various elements on the um, stream here. So yeah, do give it a go if you don't know which font to use, at least. <clears throat> OK, um, let's move on with our covering the toolbar here. You have a stock standard search and replace toolbar here. This one is workspace wide, but um, you can also just press Control F and search, you know, in the currently opened editor. Then here on the left, you can get the source control view. For us, it's mostly relevant for um, Git. But you get an overview of all unstitched and staged changes. You can take a look at the commit history and so on and so forth. It's very, very useful um, unless you're comfortable with command line git and would prefer not to use it, then that's completely fine as well, right? Next up is the debugger view, which I will cover a bit later once we get to the relevant section. Just know that it's here. Um, and it will also show a bit of a tutorial on how to use it. And the last one, this one, is what's um, provided by the Julia extension. And um, it has a workspace view, a documentation view, and a plot navigator currently. We're looking into adding more um, sections to this, but we're not quite there yet. Um, I'll go into detail, or yeah, I'll provide more details on all of these um, as they come up while we actually use the extension. OK, um, if there are any questions related to setup, then feel free to ask them. I'm looking at the comments on Pigeonhole and on, on YouTube. So let me know if anything was unclear, if you need help setting anything up if your Julia Hub instance doesn't spin up. Um, I'll just try mine now and see, see if that works. Yeah, and indeed, um, we did get, we did get an instance here. And start a terminal, can start a Julia, REPL, and so on and so forth. So if you haven't uh, managed to set up VS Code locally or don't want to, then do feel free to follow along on Julia Hub. But let's get back into it. <clears throat> um, if we go back to, to our agenda, then um, we'll try to write and evaluate some code in Julia. Um, for that reason, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I'm very used to using shortcuts for doing stuff in, uh, in VS Code. So it might, um, I might not always remember to use commands for that so you can follow along, right? Uh, the command you're interested in right now is Julia start rebel, which does as it says. For me, the shortcut is Alt J, Alt O should be the same for all of you, although I'm not sure about Max. So <laughs> take take that with a grain of salt. Um, start REPL does. Uh, 
that REPL does indeed, uh, I mean, I already had one running, so it didn't do anything. Uh, do yes, that REPL does indeed <laughs> start a REPL session here. And this is a fairly standard REPL session. Um, as you can see, I'm running Julia version 1.6.2 here. Um, there's some things about this session are special, which relate to the integration with VS Code. So in a sense, it's not the same as if you were to start a new terminal and then start Julia in it. Um, we do load a bit of code, so startup is a bit slower and um, yeah. This session is a bit special. You'll see the different features you get from that a bit later though. <clears throat> okay, um, so let's get into um, writing code in, uh, in Julia. Uh, the first thing here is that if you run a line of code in VS Code, and you can do that with various commands, the one I would suggest using right now is execute code in REPL or execute code in REPL and move. The letter has um, the shortcut alt enter. Hmm. I just broke something, which is a bit unfortunate in this demo. Um, I guess you could say that some parts of the extension have some stability issues. So I'll just close this window and restart it. Um, you shouldn't run into any of these issues unless you um, unless you change the Julia path too often. <clears throat> Anyways, um, once VS Code is started, um, there's a bit of a delay um, that's indicated by the starting language server um, panel in the um, status bar down here. And it does, as it says, it starts the Julia language server. Currently, this takes a bit longer than most of us would like it to. The insider's version should be substantially faster, but I've not used it for this demo. And um, if you're using it, then, then this should look much better. Anyways, um, the language server started now, and I can use um, this execute code in REPL and move command or alt enter. And if you don't have a Julia REPL running, we'll start one for you. And then we will um, figure out which code block your cursor is currently on and evaluate it. So this expression here, x, x equals three, just has a return value of three, and we'll display that in line. So that's what the setting I was talking about earlier is about. If you print code, I'm just going to use Alt Enter from now on because it's uh, much more convenient than just having to go to the command palette every time. If you print code, then that's not going to be displayed in line. Um, the print line function has a return value of nothing, which we just indicate by this check mark here. But the terminal itself will obviously show the um, string we've printed here. Um, a common trip up, basically, is that um, the Julia terminal or Julia REPL is, for example, started in this uh, JuliaCon Workshop 21 uh, directory, but my code file itself is in JuliaCon Workshop 21 slash code slash file name, right? Um, so important to consider that file or more appropriately at there um, will point to whatever uh, directory your folder is in, whereas pwd, so the current working directory, is always determined by the running Julia session. <clears throat> if you're a bit familiar with um, Julia itself, then you okay, this is then you will know about modules. Um, I'll just <laughs> try to get the whole module and a bit of code below it uh, on the screen here. Uh, so I've got this module here, um, module, my module. And um, 
if you look at the lower right here, you see a couple of things. One is the current file is a Julia file. Um, VS Code can automatically de detect that if your um, file has extension.jl. But right next to it, there is this main. And main is the module that all top-level Julia code runs in. So if I, um, in the REPL, execute some code, then that's evaluated in the main module. So I can even ask Julia what module I'm in with uh, at module macro, and it'll tell me it's in main. Um, so this indicates where your or where the code your current cursor is on will be evaluated. If I move down into the my module <laughs> module, then you'll see uh, my module in parentheses. The reason for that is that we've recognized that you're inside of a module, but there is no uh, module called my module loaded in Julia yet. We've not executed this part of the code. Um, you can just click on anywhere in the module definition and then Alt Enter. And the return value of this code block here is the module my module. You can also see that the background of um, background of the uh, whole code block basically flashes brightly um, and briefly <laughs> in blue to indicate which part of your code was actually evaluated. Now, after I've evaluated this code, the selector down here will display my module, not in parentheses anymore, because now this module does in fact exist, and I've um, got this module in the main namespace. So I can just call certain functions in it, right? Um, my module dot hello just returns a string hello and whatever you give as input. Um, maybe I would prefer this to be slightly different. Maybe add a comma here. I mean, why not, right? Um, and you could now, of course, re-evaluate the whole module, but that's actually not necessary. Um, once you're in here, um, and the module selector has changed to my module, you will um, be able to execute code in inside of that module. So that's not something the Julia REPL itself will allow you to easily do. But if I you know, click Alt Enter here, then you will end up with, um, the, with the redefined function hello. And if I now re-execute this, I will in real time basically get the changes. <clears throat> I have a few more functions in here to show off a bunch more of these features. And um, one of those is this rational-ish <laughs> function. Currently, it um, just constructs a rational. Fancy syntax for this is two slashes. Um, and if I call it with zero and zero as inputs, um, then it's going to throw an error. We can, um, the, the display mode I've selected will show that error in the REPL as well as in line in the editor. So we can take a look at the stack trace here. Turns out that constructing um, a rational with a zero in the nominator and denominator doesn't work. Julia throws an error. But maybe, um, I want to figure out where that error actually comes from. You can either click on the various paths in the stack trace down here. So for example, this is a constructor for rational with two in 64 as its arguments, right? Um, I can control click this as this pop-up helpfully says, and we'll end up here. Uh, you might already have noticed the various um, red background lines here. And um, these indicate lines on which an error was thrown. So in this case, this call errored, and further down the stack trace, there's this call, and so on and so forth. You can also hover over this inline result here. So I'll just have my cursor over it. And um, we'll have the error here, and also the complete stack trace. So you can just, you know, 
scrap your way through it from here. These arrows in, at the top here allow you to um, change to the next or previous stack frames if you so desire. So in that way, you can follow the stack trace down to where the actual error was thrown. And indeed, it turns out that um, this rational constructor here checks whether the denominator and denominator are 0. And if they are, then this will throw this argument error. Now, we might want to handle this code in our rational-ish <laughs> function. And um, for example, we can check is x equal 0 equal uh, x equal y equal 0. And if that's the case, we want to, I don't know, let's return 1, for example. Right. Um, we re-evaluate re this. Um, yeah, the question came up how you uh, execute a line of code on Mac. I'm not entirely sure. But if you hit Command Shift P, I think, then um, the command palette comes up and will tell you um, the default key binding over here, or at least it should. I hope you can read all of that on on this uh, on the stream. <clears throat> right. Anyways, um, back to our rational-ish function. Um, we've reevaluated this. So if x equals y equals 0, then we return 1 over 1 as a rational. And um, if we now re execute this call, then indeed we get that answer. So all of this is very convenient if you want to, if your code is already in various modules and you want to figure out or rather you want to iterate over your function definitions in there. <clears throat> Once you write a bit more complex code, you'll undoubtedly run into structs or mutable structs maybe. And if you have these inside of a module, or rather if you uh, want to change something about them, then you'll get an error. Invalid redefinition of constant custom struct. And um, you'd get the same error in the REPL. So if I have struct and then try to redefine it with, um, let's say, one field x, still get the same error. Uh, Julia can't update um, struct definitions inside of a module, period. Um, that error, so my previous definition with only one field for custom struct still works, as you can see here. But if I do want to update it to this struct with x and y, two fields, right? Um, then what I can do is just reevaluate the whole module. For that, I just put my cursor again on the module, my module part up here, or just the modules end down here, right? And this will reevaluate the whole module. And we won't get an error, because basically the whole module has been replaced. Julia will complain a bit about it. It'll throw a warning. But we don't really have to worry about it too much, except for the fact that um, all the definitions of structs inside of that module will need to be reevaluated. Otherwise, you'll run into somewhat hard to understand errors. Anyways. Um, you see this blue underline here? Um, possible method call error? Sure, makes sense, right? Um, the old constructor for custom struct calls this struct with only one argument, but now we have two fields. So let's just fix that real quick. And you can also see um, this very helpful overlay here that tells you which um, part or which um, field you're providing a default value form basically here. So we can just reevaluate the function just fine. The only issue are structs and mutual structs and abstract types and so on and so forth. Basically any constant. Um, all right, and now my definition is updated. If I reevaluate it, then I get custom struct of one and two, just as we had hoped for. 
Um, now there's this uh, suggestion basically to put your code into uh, packages as soon as possible, basically as soon as they get at least a little bit complex, right? Um, and um, we have this great JuliaCon.jl module here, um, which basically prints where we are in the schedule right now. And might be fun to play around with that for a little bit. So let's develop um, JuliaCon. I've already um, got that locally, so it doesn't do much here. But um, JuliaCon is in my environment, so I can load it <laughs> and call the various functions it provides. One of them is JuliaCon 2021. Um, another is JuliaCon.now. As you can see here, JuliaCon.now um, prints out which um, yeah, workshop uh, which workshops or talks are um, live at the moment. Um, yeah, um, JuliaCon 2021 does indeed provide this welcome banner and JuliaCon.now will, oh, I messed up. Damn. <laughs> uh... Let me just um, retry this. Didn't have um, tried this talk before. <laughs> okay. Um, back into it. We load JuliaCon, and this time it it actually is as it was, you know, before, or as it was uh, on GitHub. If we call JuliaCon now we'll get um, an answer in a little while that there are currently two workshops going on. One of them is this one, and then there's this differential equation one in parallel. Uh, but we might just end up um, being unhappy with this answer. And I don't know, maybe we just want the package development workshop. Who knows? Um, so now we can give the various code navigation options in VS Code a go. The easiest way to go to a function definition is if you hover over it, it will tell you um, where, oops, where all of these, uh, where all of the different methods for functions are defined. So um, that's inside of my dev directory, inside of the JuliaCon package, inside of source, inside of t-shirt code for some reason. And I can click on these hyperlinks, and VS Code will open up the correct file at the correct line for me. The function I'm actually interested in is JuliaCon.now, which I've just demoed. And I could also hover over it and you know click here. But the more convenient way is to control click to show the definitions of this function. Now, Julia does have methods for, or multiple methods for each function. So we get three definitions here. The top level one that's called um, initially, and then dispatches to either now with the terminal as a first argument, whoops, or um, with a text, with a wall text as a first argument. Now I happen to know that terminal is the one we are um, interested in here, so I can double click to go to this part of the code and might just, I don't know, let's just print line live from the VS Code workshop. I don't care too much about the other workshop, right? So let's just return here. Um, Now, in some cases, the module detection in VS Code uh, fails. This is one of these cases. Um, VS Code still thinks that we're inside of main, as you can see down here. So if I evaluate this, um, it'll actually work, <laughs> unfortunately. But it won't um, work once I reevaluate this code here. It will still um, display the same 
um, response as before. That's because we just redef or that's just because we defined a new function called now inside of main. You can, however, click this selector down here in case automatic detection doesn't work, or you want to try to, um, or you want to try to um, evaluate code in a different module for some reason. And I can just type in JuliaCon here and manually set the module to JuliaCon. And this will allow us to overwrite the previous method. So if I reevaluate this code again, use this one, then we can, uh, then we only get live from the VS Code Workshop without um, this differential equations one. Not to say that that workshop isn't great too. I'll just revert the changes here again. Um, and reevaluate the function. So we can get the previous uh, we can get the previous um, answers. <clears throat> Another thing that many package developers are used to using, I'll just finish up this file, then I'll answer a bunch of questions. Um, yeah, another thing that many package developers like to use is revise, which is a very um, impressive package by Tim Holy. Uh, revise basically allows you to do very similar live editing, even though it's a bit more powerful and a bit more automatic. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you can just install revise with um, a session here and started a new one just to show you how it works. Um, you can install Revise with um, in the um, package manager REPL with at Revise. I've already done it, so it won't do much. Well, it'll update for some reason. Um, and after that's finished, we can call using Revise in a second here, hopefully. We can call using revise. And after that's done, any using statement will actually um, use revise to monitor changes to the files in those packages that have been imported, not to say using. <laughs> um, and if I call using JuliaCon, then that works as normal. JuliaCon.now also will spit out an answer in just a second. Um, these um, yeah, blocking tasks for the language server, as you can see down here, are basically a bug. We'll fix that very soon, hopefully. But yeah, um, this is now executed. We get the previous answer. <clears throat> but if I control click the now method again, um, it's not the text one, it's the terminal one. So go here. And then as before, change the definition of it to maybe live from VS, uh, from the VS Code workshop with revise and return. Then I've only just saved this file with control S in my case, but um, most of you are probably familiar with how to do that. Um, yeah, um, I've only saved this file. I have not re-evaluated it inside of the VS Code extension. But if I um, call juliacon.now again, it will take a while on the first invocation because Revise is compiling a bunch of code. But um, apart from that, it will basically work as before. So this is a very powerful method for developing packages. You can um, just have revise running inside of your Julia session, edit your code and try it live in the REPL. Uh, none of this is specific to VS Code, but it's just a very um, popular way of editing code. I personally don't use it very much. I much prefer having full control over which code is evaluated and which isn't, which does have its advantages and disadvantages. Um, uh, somewhat common disadvantages 
that you might forget to update the definition and then get hard to track down errors or something like that, which usually doesn't happen with the revised. <clears throat> but basically, that's just personal preference. I'll uh, just go over a few of the questions here. Um, is there a way to extend the REPL history? Yes. I think you're talking about the scrollback buffer inside of VS Code. That's fairly easy to extend. Um, if you go into the settings, then there's a terminal, oh, maybe setting. Yeah, terminal scrollback buffer. And um, yeah, as you can see, it, I think it defaults to 1,000 lines or something. I've set it to 10,000 lines, which is fine. Um, maybe try 100,000 if it's necessary. I don't know. Um, just try whatever makes sense for you. But yeah, the default is a bit small. 10,000 lines usually works just fine for me. Um, is there a convenient key binding to switch from the editor to the terminal and back? I'm not sure, not really. So control J will toggle the terminal at the bottom. Basically, it does what you want. If the focus is inside of the editor, uh, editor <laughs> uh, I can type here. If I hit Control J, um, the REPL is focused. If I hit Control J again, I can keep typing. But the unfortunate part here is um, that the um, terminal vanishes, right? In On the Insiders version, I think uh, the shortcut to start a new REPL session, so Alt-J-O, will also focus the REPL. And um, I'm pretty sure there's one, uh, there's a command to focus the editor view here. Well, not that one. But yeah, it's basically um, a known issue that, that we need something like that, yeah. OK, a bit slower, sure. We'll do that. Um, is there a setting to add a new line when executing the last line of the file? No, there is not. We probably should have one. And I think there's an open feature request for it. But no one has gotten around to implementing it yet. My ASDF struct ended up in main. That's because the REPL itself will always evaluate code into main. So that's maybe a bit non-obvious, but module in the REPL will always evaluate to main. Uh, yeah, will always evaluate to main, no matter what the uh, module selector down here is set to. I will indeed share my files as a REPL. I can do that right now, I suppose. Um, I'll do it in the break, I think. Mm -mm -mm. Color theme I'm using is indeed Atom 1 Dark. Um, you can also see that over here. Uh, somewhere. 1 Dark Pro is what it's called. Um, there, I think currently there is a way to move the uh, terminal to other panes. So you can move it over here, for example, fairly easily. Mm, and I think it's possible to move only certain parts of the terminal to other panes, but I haven't played around with it. It's a fairly new feature in any case. OK, I will slow down. Got a bunch of feedback on me being too fast. Um, oh yeah, just one more question on um, whether to install VS Codium or VS Code on Linux. I would suggest uh, I would suggest the official distribution, so Visual Studio Code. VS Codium is great, especially if you're concerned about installing Microsoft products on your machine. 
uh, but no, there should not be any differences in performance or memory, memory footprint in that regard. You just won't be able to install certain packages at all. Um, Mm. Oh, yeah, and one YouTube comment about um, whether Julia 162 should work with VS Code. Yes, it should. If it doesn't, then first make sure that your uh, version of the extension is up to date, which should happen automatically. If it isn't, then um, try updating manually. And if you're still getting errors, then feel free to ask on uh, the Julia Lang discourse or on GitHub. Um, okay, one more question that just came in. Uh, Autoformatters, those are a sore topic, actually. So we ship one that kind of works, but sometimes doesn't. I've mostly got it disabled. I would very heavily recommend uh, juliaformatter.jl as, as your formatter. And we will actually integrate that with um, with uh, the extension at some point in the fort, uh, in the hopefully near future. There are very few technical issues we'll need to work around and no one actually had time to look into it. But yes, I, I'd heavily uh, recommend juliaformatter.jl if you want to look into auto-formatting at all. Okay. So, um, I hope at least some of you could follow along with me trying to um, tell you how to evaluate code. The main thing you need to remember, as I said before, is just hit Alt Enter and we will evaluate your code. Um, uh, sometimes interesting thing is if you want to um, not evaluate a whole code block, but only part of it. So for example, only the string, then you can select that part of your code and um, hit Alt Enter again, and we'll only evaluate the selection. So that's sometimes useful. <clears throat> now, all of the um, all of what I've showed now is about evaluating code line by line, which is very helpful for either interactive development or you know data analysis tasks. But you might also just want to um, run a whole file. For example, if you you know have a file that loads some data, massages it, and then writes it out into another file. And the easiest way to do that is to click this arrow in the upper right. It will have this dropdown, which you might not be able to read because it's not scaled with the rest of VS Code, unfortunately. Um, but the first option here is Julia execute file in REPL. And if I do that, um, then, well, <laughs> uh, I have this exit command here, but it did actually evaluate all of this code in the REPL and then closed it, unfortunately. Um, if I comment out this part of, your, uh, of the code, um, you will be able to see what's actually going on. <clears throat> So yeah, it does indeed print the hello world statement up here. Does a bunch of stuff in here. Loads um, JuliaCon, the module, and then the file is done. Um, another option is to run all of your code inside of a new process. I usually don't recommend people to do that at all, mostly because um, Julia, unfortunately, still does have quite some overhead when it comes to loading modules, although that's gotten much better recently. Um, so you can indeed uh, use Julia run file and new process here. And I'll just you know try that. It will start a new Julia process and a new terminal in the terminal pane. I should turn off my notifications. Um, we'll run through all of this code. So it'll print hello world, it will load our um, JuliaCon module and call the no function, which prints some code. 
and then it finishes. Um, the terminal will stick around unless you press enter to close it, um, just so you can you know, check the print output. <clears throat> Yeah, if anyone um, knows how to evaluate code inside of the editor, so what's Alt-Enter on my machine um, on a Mac, that would be great. So Paul can follow along. I unfortunately don't have a Mac myself, so um, I'm not entirely sure what the key binding is mapped to on Macs. But if you... Um, yeah, if you use a Mac and know the shortcut, then please post it in the um, post it in the YouTube chat or on Pigeonhole as an answer if that's possible for other people. Um, oh, my REPL with VS Code should mostly work just fine. Yes, I'm not aware of any major issues. The integration. Um, Oh, on Mac, it's Control Enter apparently. So to give that a go, um, yeah. Uh, on my Rebel is fine. Should be fine. Yeah. Um, is there a way to execute a whole block of code in VS Code, uh, similar to MATLAB, where a section starting with percent percent can be executed independently? Yes, actually, there is. Um, so I never can remember the default cell separator. But if you search in, oh, it's not a setting apparently. Um, I think it's hashtag hashtag. And then you can have some code in here. And the command to execute this is, um, is execute code cell in REPL and move, or just execute code cell in REPL. Um, by default, it should be shift enter on probably all operating systems. So if I hit shift enter here, it will, okay, this is a bad example. Um, if I have two, or whatever, how many statements here and hit shift enter, then um, the code block delineated by hashtag hashtag um, will be executed and same for down here. If I do it up here, then it will run all of the code in the file, basically, up to this point. And then results aren't super pretty in this case, but um, hopefully workable. Um, execute file in REPL could, in theory, save your code before, you, before it's executed. I personally haven't found that to be a very important feature. But um, if you do think so, then do feel free to open an issue on um, on GitHub at um, github.com slash julia dash vs code slash julia dash vs code. I'll just um, create a banner in a second so you can um, figure out Uh, so you can figure out um, where to do that and don't have to have to listen to me. Uh, control enter on Mac. Oh, I think control enter on Mac actually does probably something different. If I hit control enter here, then it will execute the code in the REPL. I assume that's the same on, on a Mac as well. Can I answer top voted questions? Yes, I don't know how to get there though. Sort by what count? Okay, never mind. Um, is it possible to have two Julia REPLs connected to the same Julia instance? No, it is not. Um, that's, in a way, that's planned, but um, it's not going to happen in this release. Or, yeah, it's not going to happen in this release. So we do hope to get another release out before Julia Con. Okay. Um, I think I'll take a five minute break here. Um, I'll take a five minute break here. 
and um, share the um, share my code in the GitHub repo, so it's it might be easier for you to follow along. And after that, we'll continue with a few of the more integrated parts of the extension. Okay, so apparently the break screen ends on its own after a while. Um, I've just pushed the code to, um, I'm muted, aren't I? Am I? I don't think so, whatever. Uh, let me just check. Okay, I'm not muted, great, sorry. Um, <laughs> I've just put up a link for uh, where you can find the code for this workshop. I hope I didn't mess anything up while pushing it.
So from there, you can hopefully follow along with what I'm doing here. None of the code I'm showing is particularly complex at all. So yeah. I'll just uh, go through a few of the quest questions again, and then um, start on a few more of the various integration parts. Okay, so one question uh, that came up again is how to get inline output. Uh, the setting for that, you can just search for Julia and result in the settings view here. And that will bring up Julia execution result type and set that to an option that includes inline somewhere. Um, the setting ID is julia.execution.result type, if that helps at all. So you could just um, is that in the search bar and it'll bring up the setting. <clears throat> we do have some tentative plans to create a welcome page for the extension that allows you to customize certain very basic settings if you start um, VS Code with the extension installed for the first time. But uh, that yeah hasn't been a priority so far. But it would be nice uh, for um, improving the first user experience, basically. Okay, I hope everyone at least kind of understood how to write and execute code in, um, in Julia, uh, in VS Code, Julia code in VS Code. Um, and I'll bring up a few things that you might find very useful when developing packages in VS Code. One of them is um, Julia does have a display system. So if I evaluate this struct here with four fields, and um, initialize it with a bunch of values, then you can see that the default printing of that is foo, one, two, three, and ASD. It's going to look exactly the same in the repo. But um, maybe three of these fields, the first three fields are internal. They are just some flags. And when printing, I would only like to print the value of the last field. The easiest way to do that is to overload the base.show method. Um, you can find the documentation for that if you just hover over the method. And it'll tell you that um, the first argument is an I.O. buffer or an I.O. object. I.O. is an abstract type, but don't worry about that right now. And the second one is um, your type, or a value of a certain type. So if I overload this method for I.O. of the type I.O. or any subtype, um, and my foo struct is a second argument, um, then I can print into this IO buffer the value of the last field. <clears throat> and if I do that, you can see that the um, shown value inside of the editor is just ASD, and the same goes for the REPL itself. <clears throat> now, the Julia display system is very powerful. It is also slightly tricky to wrap your head around. I would very much suggest reading the documentation on it. Um, but one of the cool things about it is that it allows you to specify show methods for arbitrary MIME types, basically. Um, a very common one, and one that's um, supported by VS Code, or rather by the extension, is uh, the image PNG MIME type. There are also other MIME types for um, different image formats. But the nice thing about that is that it um, allows us to leverage the built-in plot pane. So I'll just define this bar PNG struct here, which doesn't have any fields. It's basically just to create the right dispatch to show off the feature, right? Um, I'll define this show method here with, um, again, IO as the first argument. The second one is the type, uh, the MIME type, sorry. And the last one is just um, the newly created structure here, right? <clears throat> and the idea is uh, that in this asset folder, I have a PNG. I want to read that in and print that, print um, a value, uh, the, a string of that value into the IO buffer and VS Code will take it from there. Let's just define the method and call bar PNG. And we'll automatically open up the plot pane and get this great banner, which uh, you're probably familiar with if you're 
in this workshop because it's on the JuliaCon website, right? Um, there are a bunch of other MIME types we support, as I said, SVG and um, GIF, for example. Uh, but we also support HTML, which is very, very powerful because it basically allows you to write your own website in a way and display that inside of VS Code. If you go, um, if you take that principle far enough, it allows you to um, set up a complete UI inside of VS Code. You can have bidirectional communication between the Julia process and the JavaScript running inside of your website. So again, I'll define this um, struct here. Again, no fields, just to create the right overloads for our show method. And then I'll um, use this special Julia VS Code slash HTML MIME type to define a method that our to define a show method that um, indicates to VS Code that um, the spar HTML struct should be displayed in the plot pane um, and that the return or that whatever this show method prints is actually going to be interpreted as HTML. Um, if you're not familiar with HTML, the string is just very basic HTML that prints a header, hello Julia con, and some paragraphs and an input field, right? Um, if I evaluate that and then call bar, bar HTML, um, Julia's display machinery will take over and will display this HTML inside of the plot pane. Um, speaking of the plot pane, if you click inside of the plot pane, the elements up here will change and you can um, navigate to the previous plot and to the next plot with these arrows. You can delete a plot with a trash can and you can also delete all plots, but that's hidden between the three dots here. It's a lowermost command, Julia delete all plots, in case you just want that. Um, <clears throat> another neat feature we have is inside of the um, Julia pane in the toolbar on the left. If you open up the plot navigator down here, um, and uh, yeah, I'll just execute the previous um, struct definitions basically, or uh, instanti instantiations again, to create new plots. The neat thing about that is um, that they pop up here in the plot navigator and I can click here to switch between these plots. <clears throat> the um, plot pane also has support for more complex MIME types, for example, for Vigalite and um, Pyplot plots. I'll just demonstrate that um, with Vigalite and Viga datasets. And um, the way you plot something with um, Vigalite is with this add VL plot macro. Dataset cars just loads that data set. Let's give that a go. And after a second or so, or a bit longer, um, a plot should pop up. And there it is. <clears throat> this isn't interactive, but as you'll see in a second, um, we can do interactive. Um, but just because I've loaded this data set, right? Um, this is a visualization of it, but it would also be very cool to um, check out the data frame, you know, this data set represents itself. To do that, um, if you've evaluated uh, the, the function call that produces your data set, data frame, or any table-like um, structure, then it'll show up here in the left under workspace. Workspace um, is a representation of all objects defined in your currently running Julia REPL down here. So if I type in JuliaCon equals cool. Okay, JuliaCon <laughs> is a const. Uh, okay, lowercase JuliaCon, I guess. <clears throat> um, then this object will show up here. It will allow you to drill down into modules as well. So if you're interested in what the JuliaCon module actually contains, 
we can open it up. Um, this sometimes take a sec takes a second, um, but you'll get an overview over all um, methods, objects, constants, whatever, everything defined in that module. So that's very useful on its own. But um, it also allows you to inspect this data set variable, for example. Um, it turns out it's a vega data set dot vega data set and has um, two fields. One of them is path, has a bunch of segments, and the other is data. Um, this isn't very useful on its own, right? It's not very easy to get an overview. I mean, yeah, we can see that there are a bunch of names defined here, and those contain a vector, and those contain values. But um, it sounds like a very table-like structure, right? And we can use that. If you hover over um, any of these, you might get this button on the right here. And um, it says open VS Code in case you can't read that. Open VS Code for a table-like object, um, which a Vega data set is, or a data frame is, or even an array is, will open up the internal um, Julia table viewer here. And that makes it much easier to get an overview over um, what this data set contains. So yeah, basically it's a bunch of cars and info on those. Um, this data table is um, sortable, so you can just click on any of the column titles here, and you can input filters and so on and so forth. It should do the trick for all, let's say, small data sets for some, de for some definition of small. Um, if you have very, very big data sets, I would uh, recommend tableview.jl for that, because um, tableview has the capability to lazily load parts of your data set so the display mechanism doesn't break down if you have a million, col million columns, for example. The uh, Julia data set view integrated into VS Code will also hopefully get that soonish. But um, yeah, it also hasn't been that much of a priority yet. And we have not, um, yeah, we don't have unlimited resources for development, right? Um, I'll just check out the questions again. Uh, how do you put the Explorer on the left and Julia Paints on the right? That should happen automatically. If it doesn't, then um, you can just drag and drop each of these tabs anywhere, right? So you get this nice overlay here, and that allows you to restructure your workspace in a way. The plot pane should also remember where you placed it, so it shouldn't um, pop up in weird spots afterwards. Okay, um, I was talking about interactivity in the plot pane earlier, and we have a few ways to achieve that in, in the Julia ecosystem. The main possibilities are WebIO and JS Surf. WebIO is um, unfortunately almost unmaintained at this point in time, so I'm not gonna showcase it, but JS Surf is um, what powers um, WebGL Maki. Maki is a very cool plotting package in Julia. And WebGL Maki is basically just a front end that can run in the browser. And as I said earlier, VS Code is basically a browser, right? So um, let's load WebGL Maki and um, yeah, try this nice plot I found on the, uh, on the demo page for uh, Maki. This is gonna take a second to compute, I think, <clears throat> but it will end up, or but will end up with a um, plot of a spiral or helix or whatever, and um, be able to, you know, rotate the camera and so on and so forth, as you can see any second now, hopefully. And there the time to first plot issue strikes again. <laughs> I haven't loaded Maki in this process before and I haven't tried displaying anything before. So uh, this 
takes a couple of seconds. Hopefully not too too many. Um, it does take a while. Okay, the plot will pop up whenever Julia's done evaluating, I guess. Um, I'll move on to the next, um, in my opinion, undervalued feature in VS Code, um, which is support for progress bars. If you've run any um, at least somewhat time-consuming tasks, then you might have noticed that it's very useful to have an indicator that something's going on and that your code is actually making progress. Uh, it's not just stuck on one instruction forever. Speaking of, the plot just finished. <laughs> um, these are quite a few data points. So uh, while the Julia code has actually finished, the display code still is ongoing. It needs to transfer a bunch of data to the VS Code plot panel, and that needs to be rendered. But if all goes well, um, We'll get a plot here in a second. Right, so back to progress bars. There are a bunch of solutions in Julia that will display progress bars in the REPL. But um, there's also a package called progresslogging.jl. I'll just open the GitHub repo for that up real quick here. Um, and that allows for this very simple syntax to um, define a loop, for example, that emits progress messages with base Julia's logging system. And the front end can then ingest those and display a progress bar as appropriate. Juno had support for that, and VS Code has support for that. Um, there are also other packages like terminalloggers.jl, which provide a REPL-based front end. <clears throat> So I'll just, um, oh yeah, uh, our plot has finished rendering here. And as you can see, I can just, you know, rotate it and drill into it and so on and so forth, which is um, pretty cool in my opinion. So you can do a bunch of things with this. Um, we could also have a truly interactive example here, but I haven't prepared one. So you could have, for example, the text field that returns a value back to Julia and allows you to I don't know, manipulate your data set like that. Um, but yeah, this is pretty neat already, I think. <clears throat> okay, um, all of this was a bit out of order because uh, the display code took a bit longer than I expected, but let's get, get back to progress bars. I have this very simple for loop here, which just, you know, iterates over one to 10, sleeps for, 0.5 seconds and print something. So you can see that it makes progress. I load progress logging first and then evaluate the code. Um, you can see that down here, you get the Julia percentage and time remaining pop up. And you can even click on it and get, a, get an actual progress bar over here. Um, feel free to take a look at the progress logging readme or docs which hopefully have built properly now. And um, you'll see a few more use cases. I'll also um, add a more sophisticated example once we get to writing our own package a bit later. Um, just one thing I wanted to show is that you can, for example, set a custom name here. Um, and that'll show up here, right? So in my opinion, that's already very useful and the nice thing about the design of this is that um, your code only needs to care about emitting progress messages. The front end can care about how to display them. So you could have a terminal-based logger, or you could have this slightly more fancy code uh, progress viewer in VS Code that also tells you the ETA, basically, of your code by just linearly extrapolating what's been emitted by, um, by the user code. Okay, um, one more thing while we're in this file. 
we have the plot navigator here and we have the workspace, but also this documentation panel, which I haven't talked about at all yet. Um, it has a few instructions here on how to get um, documentation, but probably the easiest thing is if you're um, you know, in an editor and have a function call here, then you can right click, and then you can right click and um, use the Julia show documentation command. On my machine, it's uh, the, the key binding for that is Alt-J, Alt-D. I'm not sure what it's going to be like on a Mac. Anyways, that will render the um, documentation for whatever symbol you're hovering or whatever symbol your cursor is on and um, show examples. It will show uh, where the various methods of this function are defined and you can just navigate navigate there from, from this documentation pane. It also has a fairly crude search functionality. So if I type in sign here and search for it, I will get an answer. And down here, there's also a doc string. Uh, hyperlinks inside of the um, documentation will mostly work fine. So sign uh, signs doc string links to, uh, for example, eigen. And if you click on that, we'll give you a doc string for that as well. Um, this documentation um, works for all or documentation pane and documentation search works for all packages that are in your current environment. So you don't even have to have them loaded in your REPL process to search through doc strings defined in them, which might be very useful um, in some cases, for example, for packages that take a while to load. Um, I'll just go through any questions that might have come up again. Um, yeah, if you're trying to use a uh, Windows subsystem for Linux on Windows to start Julia, then it's probably easiest to use uh, the remote extension for um, WSL in VS Code. And after that, everything should work fine. That said, I haven't ever tried this myself, so who knows? I've heard reports that it works for what that's worth. <clears throat> Um, yes, there is an indicator for whether the Julia kernel or REPL is busy. Um, even if you're not uh, using the progress bars or progress logging macros, for example, um, if I just type in sleep 10 and execute that, thing will happen for 10 seconds, but you do get this Julia is evaluating indicator in the status bar. This is also tied into the REPL. Um, so if I execute sleep and here, then you get the same indicator. Mm, one more kind of neat thing about all of this is, um, this isn't specific to progress bars, but they just make it a bit um, more obvious. If you click on, on the indicator down here, if you click on the indicator down here, and uh, you'll see this console button, if you click it, will basically just send an interrupt exception to your Julia REPL. And in this case, it interrupted the sleep call. It's very unlikely to interrupt print line because that's basically instant. Um, you can also just um, use Control-C in the REPL to interrupt code, no matter whether it's um, executed inside of the editor or in the REPL. So if I um, copy paste the code into the REPL, it will do something, I hit Control-C and it's interrupted. Uh, the feature should work fine on all major operating systems. Although it's been slightly tricky to get to work on, on Windows. Okay, um, 
let's move on to debugging. Debugging has been, uh, let's say, hot topic in Julia land for quite some time. Um, I think at JuliaCon two years ago in Baltimore, we um, showed the first, yeah, I think two years ago. Yeah, uh, we showed the first um, implementation of a, a debugger that's compatible with Julia 1.0. Um, which is based on Julia interpreter.jl and the front end was debugger.jl. You can still use that, but maybe um, you might be interested in a graphical debugger. And Juno has that, and VS Code also has that. I'll just um, go through the basics on how to use the debugger and then um, give a few tips and tricks to um, make sure the debugger works in situations that might be a bit um, performance sensitive, for example, in which case the interpreter might be too slow for you to actually do anything useful. Okay, so the way I always use the debugger in VS Code is with um, the at enter and at run macros. These are automatically defined in the Julia REPL session by a package we load on um, REPL startup, and they will uh, run the you know provided function inside of your current REPL session, but interpret it. So what's the difference between at enter and at run? At enter will allow you to step through your code. At run will interpret your code and stop at breakpoints or exceptions or so on, as you'll see in a second. So this uh, function call here calls um, GCD on two arguments and then prints the result. If I just you know do it like this, it will print two as expected. If I run it with at enter, then this is going to take a second because there's a bunch of communication going on between VS Code and the Julia session. But after that's done. We get this um, file here, which is a bit unfortunate, but basically just shows us that we are executing this code here. And um, you can use the debugger toolbar over here. It might be in a floating window. I'm not sure if I changed that setting from the default. Anyways, um, you can continue your code, which will basically do the, do the same thing as run and keep going until um, you hit a breakpoint or you hit an exception or your code returns, basically. You can step over a function call. So in this case, um, yeah, it will also just return, basically. Um, you can step into the next function, step out of a function, and um, restart the whole uh, debugging session, basically. In this case, I want to step into the GCD function call. So let's just hit that. Shortcut is F11, um, but I'll mostly use these buttons so you can follow along. Um, okay. I have no idea what just happened. Oh, I have an idea what just happened. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, um, this isn't quite working as I intended it to, because there are a few settings um, you actually need to change for this code to run, or to work, rather. Um, I'll tell you about them now, so you can follow along or at least I'll tell you what you need to do. You just need to click on the minus button down here in the Julia compiled code pane. I'll explain what all of this does a bit later, but it's a bit more of an advanced topic. So if you're unfamiliar with the VS Code debugger, I'll just um, go through this code now and we'll explain what's the deal with all of this down here a bit later. So um, I'll just stop this session again and start from the beginning. Make sure you click the minus button at the compiled um, entry here before you before you try this yourself. 
Um, okay, we have these two function calls. We'll step into the GCD call first. And um, there are a few things going on here. It will um, The VS Code debugger will open up the file we've ended up in. It will indicate the current currently running line, or rather the line that's going to be run next. It will give you uh, an overview over the call stack. So basically, this is a top level entry, and this is a um, call to GCD that we're currently in. It will list all of the local variables defined. So that's our two argument, arguments, A and B, 22 and 10, and the type of them, which in this case is int 64, right? Um, I can step over these function calls with, well, <laughs> step over, and this will skip to the next line. As soon as a new local variable is defined, that will also show up in the variables pane over here. And um, yeah, we can just you know go through this code. Um, in this case, we'll end up at a loop. So maybe it's easiest if you just set a breakpoint down here and continue um, the function invocation, because we don't want to go through this loop a bunch of times. At least not until we are interested, or unless we are interested in what's actually going on in, in there. Um, so as you can see, continue did actually stop at this breakpoint as we expected it to. Our variables v and u got updated to these values, and we can keep going. And the result two is printed now. All of that is basically what we expected to happen. Um, in many cases, you're not actually interested in stepping through all of your code. You're just interested in what's going on at a certain you know, place in your code. So that's where breakpoints come in, of course. I'll just set one here arbitrarily. You can do that by clicking um, on the left of the um, line number gutter here. It will highlight where it would set the breakpoint and then just click. Um, the breakpoints view on the left will list all of your breakpoints. You can activate and deactivate them with a button on the left, and you can also delete them. So let's see what happens if you use the add run invocation here. Um, yeah, let's just give it a go. And it turns out we just end up directly at our uh, breakpoint, which, I mean, should be as expected, right? <clears throat> so those are the very, very basics for what we can do with a debugger. Um, there are also a few more um, modes for when the debugger should stop invocation. So um, let's go back to our <laughs> rational numbers here. Uh, as we already saw in, the, in an earlier file, 0 over 0 as rational will throw an error, right? So let's try running that through the debugger. And yep, we will end up, um, you know, this checkbox is ticked. So we stop on uncaught exceptions. We um, will give you the whole stack trace again and um, well, local variables. So now in this case, you can't continue execution. An exception is um, basically terminates um, terminates execution of your code, but you can still inspect the various scopes, right? So this function is very uninteresting. It just throws the error. But if we go up in the stack trace, um, we can see that it's in the rational function on the rational t um, with type t constructor, and that's called by this rational constructor, and that's called by the slash slash function. And um, that's called by our function here. <clears throat> the um, nice thing about um, this is that you can also inspect all local variables and use those to figure out what caused your error to be thrown. But um, yeah. There's, uh, as you can see, also this checkbox here on all exceptions. 
I'll show off what that does in a second. Um, so if we, um, yeah, let's just set a breakpoint here and run our code again. Then um, we stop execution here. If we continue, we end up at the error again. We can't continue any further. So we need to stop the debugging session and go back here. So maybe we can just add some um, error handling to our function, right? That's not good style, but it um, hides the error for now. Um, let's just put the rational constructor inside of a try catch. Uh, we don't really care about the error, but we want to return one over one as, as a value if this call throws an exception. If we evaluate the code again in the debugger, um, we stop at the breakpoint as expected. And if we continue on from there, the code finishes just fine, even though an exception was thrown. Um, that's because we only break on uncaught exceptions. If we take this checkbox as well and restart the debugger again, um, then we end up at this exception again. So yeah, all of that is probably working just as expected, but I wanted to show it off anyways. <clears throat> Another thing that's actually kind of um, nice about all of this is that um, you can modify local variables inside of the debugger. So if we run our function again um, with an input of zero, then we'd expect this to error in a second, but you can actually click on, on the input value here, um, double click rather, and change this value to, for example, 10. So update here. You can also go to the um, debug console down here, and this allows you to evaluate arbitrary code. And you can also check uh, on the value of our input, uh, input argument x here. So let's just do that. And indeed, x equals 10. We can, for example, also preempt what's going to happen if um, you know the next line runs. So y equals 10x. You know, and this won't introduce a new local variable y but it'll still allow us to figure out um, what the next value is going to be. If we continue on with the uh, execution, then yeah, indeed, y equals 10 times 10, 100. And um, in the terminal, we'll um, print 0 over, well, again, this is that example will print um, zero <laughs> over 100, but that's going to be um, pushed down to zero over one. Uh, so yeah, let's try try all of this again, and indeed um, we'll get one over 100 as expected. So that's kind of nice if um, you want to check out what your function does with various inputs without actually calling it again and again. Um, now, there's also this nice feature here. Um, if you hover over um, over a stack entry here, there's this button on the right that is restart frame. This is somewhat of an experimental feature and, of course, breaks as soon as any side effects are present. But um, yeah, it does what it you know, says on the tin. So um, if I just restart this frame, um, I'll end up with x equals 0, y equals 0, because that's what I called the function with. Um, but I could also, um, you know, mm -hmm, you know, set another breakpoint at y equals 10x, restart the frame, and that's a bug. Very unfortunate. Um, OK, I need to restart the debugging session for this. But um, what it basically allows you to do is um, define x equals 10 and continue running up until here. Um, then you might want to restart the frame. And it's a very experimental feature. I would not suggest you use it right now. Let's um, stop there. Um, 
Okay, the whole catching uh, caught exception we've already talked through. So let's move on to conditional breakpoints. Um, if you have a long loop, for example, this loop of um, 100 iterations that just prints out a value, um, you might be interested in what happens at a certain iteration. So to do that, you can add a breakpoint in your loop. And if you then right click it, one option is edit breakpoint. Edit breakpoint allows you to set a set an expression that evaluates to a Boolean value. And if that's true, then the breakpoint is active. If not, then um, execution will continue as normal. So in this case, let's say I'm interested in what happens if i is greater than 20, let's say. Um, hit Enter. The symbol slightly changes. It's very subtle. But the pop-up tells you that the expression condition is i greater than 20, right? Um, let's execute this code. And indeed, um, the first time our breakpoint is hit is when i equals 21. And it's going to be hit on 22 and 23 again. But um, we could modify our condition to take that into account if you so wanted. I've just removed this breakpoint again by clicking. And after that, code execution will continue as normal. And we'll get all our 100 numbers printed here. <clears throat> now, there are a bunch of um, more advanced features you might want to use when dealing with actual code. Um, and there are a few tricks, basically, to get into the code you're interested in. So when stepping through um, our GCD example again, we can, um, yeah, there are a few few options that aren't in the toolbar here, but are hidden behind the right-click menu. Um, one of those is you might not be able to read any of this because it's not scaled up with the rest of the UI. Um, but uh, one option is run to cursor. So you basically right-click on any line and click run to cursor. And that basically sets a breakpoint here, runs your, continues your code, and stops the line. Um, now you might be wondering what um, what to do on a line with multiple function invocations if you're just interested in stepping into unsigned, for example. You could, of course, um, you know, step into the first function call, the shift here, and then step out again, and step into the apps function call, step out again, and then step into unsigned. But that's very inconvenient. So what I would suggest is to use the uh, to use the step into targets functionality that's also only accessible with a right click menu here. <clears throat> but it will show you this little pop up here, which has all of the different um, function calls on a certain line. So um, yeah, it lists the right shift, the call to apps, and the call to unsigned here. Um, if you're interested in stepping into the unsigned call, for example, just click on that. We will run until that call is hit, step into it, and you can check out what's going on in there, step out again, and you're, you'll end up on the next line. So that's very useful to um, step through your code quickly without using breakpoints and to basically end up where you want to be with the uh, least um, amount of clicks and least inconvenience possible. So I'll just um, step or continue the execution of that function again and go back here. Um, as I said before, the debugger uh, can be kind of slow in some cases. Basically, we have a constant overhead for each function invocation. And in many cases, that ends up very are being very problematic. Um, for example, if you have, a, have an image which uh, yeah by normal standards, um, but it still might end up cause, causing a million function calls. And even if we have just a very small overhead for each of these function calls, which is the case with interpreted code in Julia, that's going to be unusably slow. Um, that's not to say that our interpreter is much slower than other interpreters in, for example, I don't know, Python or MATLAB. It's just that we never end up at a specialized compiled C kernel, let's say, or a C loop, right? 
<clears throat> so I've got this uh, little piece of code here to um, generate an image of the Mandelbrot set. And that calls a bunch of functions. It has a loop here and um, it has this function here to time, time our code, right? So if I execute all of this um, with a step of 0.005, um, that's going to be on a domain that has 421,000 points, roughly. I haven't actually done the math and figured out how big the resulting image is, but not tremendously big. The code's going to take a little while on the first run, 0.245 seconds because that includes compilation overhead. Second one is only takes half as long, basically. But yeah, it does produce the expected figure, which is all nice and dandy. But um, if we were to run this through the debugger, we wouldn't <laughs> finish today, I don't think. Um, just to show what happens, I'll run it on a much smaller domain. So domain calling domain one, basically, um, generates a 4 by 4 matrix with a bunch of complex numbers. On each of these complex numbers, we run the um, this iteration instruction here. We convert it to a color, and yeah, that's it basically. Um, so if I run that through the debugger uh, without any breakpoints or anything that inhibits execution, we'll basically end up with the time it takes to interpret our code. That's basically exactly as slow as it takes to run the compiled Julia code on our 420 odd thousand points for 16 points. As you can imagine, it doesn't make any sense to run the original code through our debugger. <clears throat> um, I'll just see what happens with a um, slightly bigger matrix. Um, this 36 by 31 matrix takes uh, 32, 320 mi uh, microseconds um, in the compiled version. And the interpreted version is going to take a couple of seconds. So I'll um, leave this running and check out a few of the questions again. <laughs> OK, yeah. Uh, as you can see, we are five orders of magnitude behind the compiled code, which does not sound great. Um, waiting 10, 10 seconds for that picture is a bit of a letdown, to be honest. But um, we do have this uh, compiled code pane here. And what that does is that it tells the interpreter which code to interpret and which to just use a compiled version for. In most cases, people are not very interested in what's going on inside of base, for example. Um, people are mostly interested in their own code. So unless you're a contributor to the main language, you're interested in the code you write, or maybe in a package you wrote. And um, there's no reason to step into code that is not uh, written by you, right? When debugging, you're interested in what you did wrong or where the error is in your code, not usually what happens in base code that's well tested and um, well, can mostly be assumed to be uh, to usually not be the cause of of whatever's going wrong with your code, right? Um, so to do that, um, you might remember that we clicked this little minus here, and um, the inverse operation basically is. Um, apply default compiled modules or functions. And what that does is that it populates this list of compiled, let's say, objects, because it can contain modules and functions directly with a set of, um, yeah, uh, with a set of functions that should be compiled or should be interpreted. So, for example, we are not really interested in anything that's going on in base at all, but there are a few higher order functions we need to interpret to get to the user code that's called by them. So for example, if we have a um, filter operation, then we need to interpret that. 
because filter is usually supplied with a um, user-defined function and we can't step into that unless the higher order function in this case filter or map or any broadcast operation is also interpreted. So this set of default um, interpreted slash compiled functions and modules um, is basically a list of stuff that I um, deemed worth to compile or not compile. It's handwritten and therefore likely to get out of date with new Julia versions and so on. So um, yeah. Currently it works fairly, fairly well. Although I think the set of compiled functions in the release is missing some broadcast variables. So the example I'm about to show might not actually work for you. Um, I'll try to update that as soon as possible. In any case, um, we've set um, this default list again. And let's try um, running our mandelbrot function again through the debugger. And hopefully, yeah, as you can see, we've gained about two orders of magnitude in execution speed. Um, the important question is, can we still set a breakpoint here? In this is the innermost function that's called that we're actually interested in. This only calls, um, you know, iterate for the loop and apps and greater than and minus and a bunch of other base functions, but we don't actually care about any of those, right? Maybe there's um, something going wrong inside of our iteration instruction here. So let's set a breakpoint in there and run our make Mandelbrot function again. And it failed, which is unfortunate because it worked earlier. Um, As you can see, this is a slightly, um, slightly experimental piece of uh, code. It usually works fine. I have no idea why it didn't in this case. So I've just killed my Julia process and will um, reevaluate everything in here again, just to see if that fixes it, because it worked earlier when I um, <laughs> prepared the workshop. It does not. Okay, so oh, it might. Let's see what happens. I forget to evaluate something. Um, right. Okay, yeah, well, that are, well, that's all for you. Um, so in the next release, we should expect this to work. In the current one, obviously not. It's possible that I forgot to uh, set a, that I forgot to, to include a certain higher order function here. But in many cases, um, this mechanism works fine and does gain you about two orders of um, execution speed in many cases. In case, any of that is not enough. Um, you can also use infiltrator.jl, which is um, not related to VS Code at all, but can give you a bit more execution speed in case you need it. The readme should be fairly comprehensive. Um, so I'll just um, skip over my example here for now. Just note that it'll give you, I mean, I can just run it real quick and um, you'll see that will give you a uh, much um, faster execution time. Um, so it will have this REPL interface and turn off the breakpoint again and rerun the code. Just so the interaction overhead is uh, nullified. We'll see that we are only like two orders of magnitude or so slower than the compiled code, which is pretty decent and should be enough in most cases. Um, this um, 
basically concludes uh, the debugging part, at least the debug inside of this REPL process part. Just real quickly, um, our Mandel function um, we can put into another file. And then much like you can run code in a new process, you can also debug this file in a new process and set breakpoints at the top level or in a function, hit debug file in new process here in the upper right. And that will basically allow you to step through your file and um, be sure that none of the um, state inside of your global Julia rebel influences any of your results because it is a new process, right? So you can step through top level statements, continue onwards. This will execute all of this code down here and then break, yeah. <clears throat> and it'll take a couple of seconds and our code is finished. You can still see what um, got printed though. If I remove our compiled code section here again, it will actually um, respect the, where did my file go? Uh, it will actually respect this breakpoint as well. So let's try this again. Debug file in new process. Um, as you can see, the overhead of starting a new Julia session and running the debugger code is fairly prohibitive. So in most cases, I would recommend you to use the main Julia REPL for debugging. Okay, I'll just go through the questions again. Um, best way to minimize pre-compilation using VS Code. Um, in most cases, that shouldn't happen very often. I think in 1.7, Juliet 1.7, that is, um, the, um, there's a better caching for pre-compiled files, which might help in this case because you might inadvertently be switching between environments very often. Um, that's kind of a, um, yeah, somewhat hidden part of the extension. So if you have this, um, if you have a workspace folder open, your REPL will automatically start in the environment of that folder. And you might have different versions of the manifest here. So possibly um, you'll end up, you know, with a bunch of different package versions and that will cause re pre compilation <laughs> once you load a package. Um, the VS Code debugger compared to Cthulhu.jl is very different, I would say. Cthulhu.jl is basically uh, um, let's say compile time slash lowering time debugger kind of, um, while, or at least as far as I'm aware, <clears throat> while um, the debugger in VS Code or debugger.jl interpret all of your code and work with actual values, right? Maybe I'm wrong about that. I haven't actually used Cthulhu.jl very much, so I don't know, someone can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, Valentina's around, he can do that. There was a comment about me increasing the stream quality. Um, I don't think I can do anything about that at this point. It's on full HD, so I don't know. <clears throat> okay. Um, if there are no more questions about debugging or anything like that, I'll just... Oh yeah, there was one question about... Um, getting this nice output of who and when um, a certain line of code was was committed. That's the Git lens extension I was talking about in the beginning, which is what I mostly use it for. It's basically a very simple Git blame view, right? 
very useful in my opinion. <clears throat> okay, um, let's move on to profiling code. I'll keep this section very, very short, um, just because uh, there's not much to say about it without actually having, you know, code that performs worse than you'd expect it to, and then you know fixing those problems, which I don't really want to get into here. Um, I have this profile test function, which basically does a bunch of, um, yeah, array operations. Um, I've just stolen the function from the profile view readme. But um, let's just try what, what happens here. Um, the traditional way to profile code in Julia is either with just um, using profile and then I think it's at profile. <clears throat> And that'll um, I should run this first. Um, and that'll run your code and instrument it such that uh, it will. Oh yeah, of course. Um, let me run it a bit more often. Well, it should give us some out. Put. Maybe I just forgot on how to use profile. Um, but anyways, I like UIs and profile view gives me a UI for this. It's a GTK window, which um, basically gives you a flame graph of what's going on inside of your code. So that'll pop up here. Oh yeah, I think you have to print the trace yourself with profile. Um, so uh, this is your or the actual code I wanted to profile. And there is a bunch of stuff going on here. You can disregard all of this to the right. That's basically just um, a false um, false report caused by the way that the VS Code extension executes your code. But over here is the actually interesting stuff. Um, this is an invocation to profile test. And you can drill down into abstract array and broadcast and views and all of the base machinery. I think if you just right click, it will open up your file inside of um, whatever editor you've defined for Julia to use. So you can actually use this with VS Code just fine. But um, it might and you might end up running into problems for standard libraries where the paths are incorrect and stuff like that. And in any case, it is um, it is a GTK application. So in some cases, uh, you might not want to run any of that. And in these cases, you can use uh, VS Code's integrated debugger, uh, profile viewer, which you can also access with the normal at prof view macro, which is the same as, or has the same name as a profile view at prof view macro. Um, it just lives in a different module. And if I run this, then by default, I get this um, table here that tells me which function took how much time. Um, I personally don't think this is super useful, but on the upper right here, you can click on show flame graph and that will show the, um, yeah, that will basically show you how <laughs> Julia's profiler works, um, and that it checks periodically where, um, where a function call is from. Ah, that looks horrible. Um, uh, when a function got called basically and, um, um, yeah, a couple of microsecond, um, every couple of microseconds. But you can also switch to the left heavy view here, which is exactly the same as what um, profile view gives you by default. And you can you know check out, this is basically where our function entry point is, main.profile view. And then you can check out, okay, that calls map slices and grant and App slices apparently is a keyword function and so on and so forth. You can, as the tooltip tells you, control click on any of these bars uh, to open a file. Uh, 
and just jump there and check out what's going on. There's also this um, inline element viewer here that should, in theory, tell you how much time a certain line of code takes. But um, that doesn't quite work as well. So I'd mostly disregard that. We're working with upstream on uh, improving the profiling capabilities. Uh, if that turns out not to be possible, then we'll implement our own profile viewer just like Juno had. So yeah, that's very briefly what's going on with profiling in VS Code. It should be mostly usable, just fine. Um, go. If you don't like it, you can always fall back to a different um, implementation or viewer. But I at least uh, find this to be good enough for now. Um, I'll just check out questions again and then take another five minute break before we get to the last segment here, which is writing our own package. Um, the plan is to just go through all of, well, to, through the whole process of um, writing your own package basically, right? And then also to check out how you might want to do test-driven development in Julia and with various ways to up, update or execute code.
Okay. I think we're back and my mic is unmuted. Great. Um, so there were a few questions that came up during the break. Um, kind of related to profiling. So um, the graph you saw on the profiler is basically um, a stacked view of uh, your of all functions that got called by your top level function invocation. And the width of each bar represent, represents how much time it took relative to other functions that got called in you know, one function. So it allows you to figure out where a performance bottleneck is basically. <clears throat> um, how's profile different from profile view? Um, it isn't really. Profile view is just a UI for um, for allowing you to more easily make sense of um, of what happens inside of uh, to more easily make sense of the stick of the trace collected by the profile standard library. Um, you can find documentation for the profile standard library in the um, Julia docs and profile view also has a great readme you can just take a look at. <clears throat> yeah, this is also where I got that function. <laughs> Okay, um, so let's write our own package, right? Um, we don't have great tooling in VS Code for creating new packages from scratch, but luckily um, Invenia has us covered and we can use package templates to create a new package um, skeleton basically. So set up the directory structure set up um, files for continuous integration, set up a docs directory, set up a readme and so on and so forth. And it also allows us to do that in an interactive way. So um, I guess we can just, you know, do that. Um, I have package templates in my environment already, but you can, of course, um, Edit yourself if you don't already have it. Um, and then after my registry has updated again, we can continue by calling, um, you know, by creating a new package, in this case, JuliaCon sample package in interactive mode. <clears throat> so let's give that a go. Um, yeah, disregard the deprecation warning, but you can customize um, the template to your heart's content. In this case, um, I want to, you know, modify uh, which user this is created under, and I want to create. Actually, no, I don't care about the directory. So by default, it's created in the um, in your home directory in the .julia slash dev folder, which is fine in this case. Um, I'll just take this box to show you what you could, you know, um, modify there. So the value for user, I'm not Travis, I'm Fitzep on GitHub. So I'll put that in here. And um, for Dur, yeah, let's, let's keep the default. Um, I'm not sure if I have to type this in again. I'll just do that to make sure. And I should have deleted the directory. Again. Okay, this does a bunch of things. But after a few seconds, it should have um, uh, created the directory just fine. And um, in VS Code, I can add that folder to my workspace just with add folder to workspace, should be fairly self explanatory. And then I need to navigate to um, to my dev directory and find the package I just created. Um, VS Code currently has this, or since the last release has this cool feature where you can 
you know, decide whether you trust trust the code in, in a directory. And in this case, yes, I do. As you can see, <clears throat> um, this has generated a package skeleton right now. So it has all the um, crucial things uh, Julia package needs, which are actually very few things. Uh, we need a um, project.toml file that has a name and a UUID. I think all other fields are optional, um, but helpfully package templates fills them in anyways, right? We have a um, compatibility field for Julia. Um, our ex, um, tests will need the tech, uh, test standard library, so it shows up in here. The package is initialized at version 0 0.1.0, .0, as is usual in Julia land. And it also correctly sets um, the authors field based on my um, global Git configuration. And the other thing that's crucially important for a Julia package so that it can be loaded is this source slash juliacon sample package.jl file that contains a module of the same name. Um, that's not all that uh, package templates has generated for us. We also get a run tests.jl file here, which helpfully loads our package, our test, um, the test standard library, and also has created a default test set for us. Then there is the license. Most packages in Julia land, I think the overwhelming majority, something like 80 or 85% are MIT licensed. Um, so that's the default for um, package templates as well. We also get a git ignore file that includes a manifest and um, a few GitHub hooks, uh, for example, for techbot and combat helper. I think the um, Configuration here allows you to add more things as well, if you so desire. For now, this is just fine. Okay. Um, so now we have this package skeleton with an awful name, but <laughs> nothing um, I'm going to do about that right now. And um, yeah, we, oh yeah, uh, one, one other cool thing. Um, if you just open a terminal in this, um, directory, which you can easily do with right-click and then open an integrated terminal that will spawn a new shell session down here. And um, and for example, um, inspect the um, uh, we can, for example, inspect the origin and package templates already set that up properly for us. So this is a Git repository. And since I supplied my username on GitHub, it um, already set upstream, uh, that set the origin correctly. So what I um, should also do is go to github.com and create a new repository here um, with joyacon sample package.jl as a name, because I mean, that's um, the convention in Julia land. Um, so let's just do that. Create repository. Um, we can just follow the instructions on GitHub here. Um, most of this is irrelevant because um, package templates already init initialized the repository for us. So the only thing we need to do is um, basically add our uh, push our push the first commit that uh, package templates already created for us. I think uh, to GitHub. So I'll just um, do that right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, one thing is uh, package templates likes to use HTTPS URLs and I'd much prefer using SSH here. So uh, I'll just uh, you know, change my origin to the SSH instead of the HTTPS URL. And push the master branch. Oh, yeah, I messed up this. And then push the master branch. And as you can see, um, on GitHub, if I reload the page, I 
shiny new package is here. Um, okay, so I don't have too much time left, so I'll just um, slightly uh, skip ahead here. Um, so what I kind of wanted to implement here is a root finding algorithm. The textbook method for that is Newton's method, right? Um, so if we, you know, either look up or remember how how that works, um, we know that uh, we want a function Newton in our main file, and that needs to take a function. It needs to take that function's derivative. So let's just call that f and f prime. We can here uh, see the yeah, Unicode features of Julia and the Julia extension for VS Code. Uh, I quite like them. People maybe think they could be a bit overkill, but I mean, a prime never hurt anyone, right? And once we start with a prime, we can also use a few LaTeX inspired features like this uh, lowercase zero. And um, let's also add a few uh, keyword arguments to our Newton method. Newton's method uh, function here, something like um, maximum number of iterations could default to 100 and the tolerance, I don't know, let's say minus eight, right? And, um, and now we have this function, we can give it a doc string here over the function signature and say something like find f's root. Uh, Newton's method, right? So that's a basic function. Of course, our function doesn't do anything yet, but that's also fine. Um, now I kind of threw in that um, buzzword of test-driven development, right? So while our function doesn't do anything yet, um, we could already write some tests for it, right? Um, so what's a good test here? Um, Let's say we want to find the root of sine. The derivative of sine is cosine, and our starting parameter is, for example, one that's zero. Um, now, where's sine zero around, you know, an x value of one dot zero? Um, all that should be something like zero. So let's, um, you know, use a prox zero for now. Um, the way I like to development is with our device, so that's what I'm going to show here. I will um, use inline evaluation in the Julia REPL, just like I showed at the, begin at the beginning of the workshop, to evaluate the whole um, the whole module here. <clears throat> and um, yeah, outside of that module, I need to you know prefix uh, prefix the function invocation. But that's fine. It's not exported yet. I can do that at a later, later time. In our um, test file, this is going to fail right now. Using JuliaCon sample package, um, oh, actually, it, yeah, it will fail um, because I've already um, evaluated it here in, in uh, main. But um, I can do using .juliacon sample package. And that would um, pull any exports in the um, in this module into main. So let's just add that now. Um, we have export Newton, our function definition, which doesn't do anything, and it's doc string. So let's reevaluate the module again, and then call using dot Julia con sample package. I'll need to revert this later, but for now it's um, fine to keep around. And using test. So with that, I can actually evaluate this test set. I fail horribly because Newton will return nothing, and nothing is not approximately zero, even though you know, <laughs> kind of sounds like like that could be true in certain um, programming language, <clears throat> but not in Julia. So yeah, our test fails. Um, I'm not gonna go with the you know. Very, very easiest um, you know, way to fix our tests. They also don't. Wait. Okay, 
um, that this should work. Um, Okay, so exporting wasn't a good idea. Um, if you prefix this, then the correct method is called. I think I messed up here and evaluated this into main by accident. Um, so from now on, I think I'll just use a prefixed version here. Um, I'll probably, you know, a qualified version of Newton instead of the one I accidentally defined in, in main here, which actually shouldn't be there. <clears throat> um, yeah, but I mean, this isn't correct, right? So um, let's, I don't have a much, I don't have much time left here. So um, I'll just, you know, cheat a bit and take this implementation here and copy paste it over here and then uh, delete a bunch of stuff that I want to explain why I add later. So what this basically does is, um, well, it implements Newton's method, right? <clears throat> it uh, calculates um, function values at xn plus one and at xn. Then it checks if the um, absolute difference of those values is smaller than the tolerance specified up here. It checks if our number of iterations exceeded the maximum number of iterations we allow. It um, updates our fn plus one value and uh, it updates a, or calculates the value of the derivative at xn plus one, it checks whether that is zero, because um, if it is, we are going to end up dividing by zero down here. And um, then, yeah, we'll get an, not a number if we're working with floating point numbers or an exception if we're working with um, integers, although that's very unlikely. Um, and then uh, we update everything and iterate again, right? So let's um, update this one again and oops, check our tests. And indeed, they still pass. So let's um, write a few more tests here. Um, I'll just take them and take those from from the other file I already have. And um, basically, we want to check that all of these um, functions I've defined here and the derivatives um, uh, actually work. So, OK, I need to evaluate all of this again. And then we can see that all of these tests here will actually work out with information I just, um, you know, took from when I prepared the workshop. Uh, this was well, in the interest of time mainly. Um, so all of these tests where I specify um, a function and its derivative and a starting point, all of these work fine, right? Up to whatever precision is specified in the tests. Um, but I mean, wouldn't it be nice to be able to um, forgo the specification of a derivative? I mean, you'd have to do that yourself, which frankly sounds annoying, right? I mean, if it's just a polynomial, then easy enough. But in other cases, you might not actually want to, you know, take the brain power to um, figure out the derivative of a function yourself. So in that case, um, let's maybe use one of um, Julia's auto automatic differentiation packages. I will just um, right click on um, on my sample package here to change to this directory, which basically just, you know, calls CD inside of the Julia REPL. And indeed, um, I've changed into this directory. I can, oh, it's already active. I don't even need to activate the package. And I want to add forward this here. 
<clears throat> which allows us to I can't spell for what if, uh, which allows us to um, automatically calculate the uh, derivative of our uh, objective function. Um, after that's happened, I can um, call using forward diff here, and then also implement a um, prepper method for, for this one, because um, the logic is still correct here. And I'm still going to reuse it. I just don't want to provide f prime myself. So I'm going to write Newton of f and x underscore 0, and then copy the keyword arguments from up here. And I'll, um, actually, I don't need this end. And I will call the other method I've already specified, except with um, forward diff dot, um, what's it called? Derivative? Derivative um, of f. Um, I need to wrap this in a lambda or an anonymous function here. And then guess the starting point and forward our keyword arguments. So all of this is like two lines of code and, and using this package. And I will just um, redefine the module again. And we can rerun. What? <clears throat> oh, yeah, I set up. Um, let's just redefine that and then um, these tests I've already written, i.e. copied from what I've prepared earlier, um, should also pass. So that's a very brief overview, because I thought I'd have more time for this, but took a bit longer than expected um, earlier. And um, yeah, we have a package. We have tests. We have something we export. So let's just, you know just to be safe that we don't have any lingering state in our um, REPL here, call test on um, our function, uh, on our package, sorry, and um, see what happens. And indeed, our tests pass. So now I can, um, I can actually show you the Git integration here. Um, you know, I've made a few changes. I've added forward diff to our project TOML. I have actually implemented something in the package and I've written some tests. So I can click the plus here to stage my changes. Um, uh, you know, write a commit notice and click the check mark here to commit our changes. Um, it doesn't show us any changes if I call git diff. So let's just push this, need the origin there. And indeed, on GitHub, um, the package is, on the package code is there. And um, we can actually register our package. What I like to use for that is Julia Hub as well. Um, and very conveniently, it has a um, register packages um, page here, and you can just paste the URL of your GitHub repository or GitLab repository if your package is on um, GitHub, uh, GitLab, sorry. Um, paste that in here and click Submit, and that should do the trick. In just a second, I'll get a GitHub, I'll get to, I will get a GitHub notification telling me that a new package of mine is, um, or has requested registration in the general registry, which I will then close because this package doesn't really have much value to anyone. Okay. Well, that was much briefer than I had anticipated. Um, I'll just go through the questions again. Five minute break video, uh, that's Comolian's work and it's great. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll try to talk a bit about how the um, 
extension works under the hood. If you don't want to use GitHub because of Microsoft and Copilot, I'd probably suggest GitLab. Today, computing does not offer a code hosting service now. Um, Revised.jl workflows probably end up fairly similar, um, except that you would not have to reevaluate the code here yourself. You would just end up saving the file, and Revise will take the um, handle the reevaluation re of your code for you. Which I mean, it's just it just comes down to personal preference, right? Either you like having full control over what's reevaluated and what's not reevaluated, re or you just say um, all the changes I've made before saving a file makes sense, makes sense together, and um, revise should handle everything for me, right? Both of these are perfectly valid. I just prefer one and not the other. Um, Oh yeah, one thing I uh, failed to mention: um, if you want to switch to shell mode inside of uh, the Julia REPL, it's um, typing a semicolon as the first character, much like you would type a closing bracket to enter the package manager mode here. In case you were not familiar with it, um, I'll take the last thirteen minutes uh, <laughs> to. Um, Show off a few cool features that the Julia extension recently got. So one thing that's not Julia really specific is um, you can open a Markdown preview for Markdown files, which is very helpful for readmes and stuff like that. That's pretty neat. Neat. Um, and I'll take it from here because this is a bit easier to read, right? Um, okay. So one cool thing: remote editing. If you need to work on, you know computationally heavy code or long running code, you might not want to use your local laptop or desktop machine for that. So there's um, a remote edi editing extension that you can add to but I already mentioned that um, earlier in the workshop. Uh, for this, I'll use remote SSH just to get to a server and you know show off running code there. Um, the way I use it is to click on the lower left here, which is open a remote window. And then you can connect to an arbitrary host. And I'll just use arctic1.computing.com. And this will open a new VS Code window, connect via SSH to that um, machine, to the remote machine. I hope this works. Um, OK, that's a bit embarrassing. <laughs> I should not have demoed the, with the insider build of this code. Um, OK, let's try release, I guess. I can show, <laughs> show how to add the package there, I guess. Um, You can you know, just um, run this real quick. It will download a bunch of things, um, but should be fairly quick, as you can see here. And then I can, again, click down here. Um, type in the host name, and then connect. If I were not to mistype it, you know, that would also be helpful. Okay, I have no idea what's going on there. Mm. OK, let's just use another server, I guess, um, that will then install some code on the remote to uh, facilitate the um, remote editing experience, basically. You can um, open folders on the remote. So I'm not sure what I have on here, but um, that's just my home directory, right? And yes, I do trust that home directory. 
has a bunch of stuff in here. It doesn't have a recent Julia version installed, unfortunately. But you can install extensions on the remote. So um, I'm not sure if the Julia extension is installed. It is not. I can just install it on the remote, which is quite nice. Um, and um, yeah, that's going to take a second. And um, your settings are um, separate for the remote. So you can set a different Julia path here, for example, if you need to. In general, it's a very pleasant experience unless, um, I don't know, the server's down or I can't type or anything uh, or something like that. Um, so I can heavily recommend making use of this. Uh, two more new features uh, we got in the Julia extension um, in the last release, I think, is the Julia connect external session command. So I'll just close all of my terminals down here to show what that does. Um, I currently, if I open a Julia file and um, you know would want to execute code, that doesn't work. There's no running Julia session. So it would start a new integrated session. But say you have two screens, for example, um, you might want to um, you know, use your second screen for the terminal and this screen for the editor. So in that case, you can just pull up a new terminal. I'll do that here. And then in VS Code, call the connect external rebel command here. It will um, show this pop-up down here and prompt you to copy some code into your Julia session. So I'll just start Julia and paste that code here. It's a slew of stuff. You don't actually need to worry about it. Um, but you should get the successfully connected to external Julia REPL um, output. You can then actually evaluate code inside of um, VS Code. I'll just show this side by side. Um, like this. And um, printing just works fine. So you can evaluate code over here. You know, X is defined. You can define Y equals two in the REPL. You evaluate two in the editor. You know, both of, both of the different UIs are synced. Um, the workspace, for example, works as well. Um, now, taking this one step further is um, say you want your Julia session to be persistent, even if VS Code is closed, or when you're on a remote to um, to have a persistent session running, even if the connection drops, or um, you know you close your laptop lid and you want the computation to continue on the remote, right? In that case, uh, you might already be familiar with Tmux, um, which is basically a terminal multiplexer, um, and you can reattach to, or um, you can create a session, start Julia in that session, um, disconnect from the session while Julia continues running in the background, and then reconnect whenever you want. Um, it's also possible for the VS Code extension to automate that for you. If you search for um, Julia persistent session, you get the Julia persistent session enabled checkbox. If you tick it, um, then the next time you create a new terminal, be it via um, inline evaluation or just with um, you know start Apple, um, we will spawn a new terminal inside of a Tmux session. That's a name Tmux session. So um, in my case, it's called Julia underscore VS Code two, and I can run code in here as before. <clears throat> um, so let's also just start a very long running loop here for Ian um, 1 to 100, sleep for a second, uh, print where we are, just so you know we can check whether progress we are making carries over, right? Evaluate this. And um, well, that's not very helpful, is it? Uh, than I. <laughs> okay, and um, then we can um, I'll stop REPL. And uh, this is a slight misnomer in this case because it will actually just disconnect from the REPL. So we don't have anything, you know, the REPL itself is not present in VS Code anymore and we're disconnected from it. But if we were to reopen it, and, for example, with Alt J O, 
um, then you can see that the code is still running. And I could even interrupt it again. OK. Um, anything else I wanted to talk about? Let's see. Right, upcoming features. Um, we are planning to improve the plot pane by quite a lot. Um, the insiders extension for VS Code actually has um, a notebook UI that you might be interested in if you don't like Jupyter much. It looks very similar, except that it doesn't use Igelia kernels at all, and as such should be much easier to set up and so on. Um, if you're interested in static checking of code, then you might have stumbled across jet.jl, on which there's going to be a workshop tomorrow. So make sure to, to look into that if you're at all interested in um, statically checking Julia code. And um, there's at least a tentative plan to integrate jet with um, the VS Code extension. Um, I'll just go through a bunch of questions. And then I think the time is up. I'm not sure if. Um, If I can go over time for a few minutes and talk about internals, if anyone's interested in that. Um, if you have constants, constants in a module, then no, you don't need to export them unless you want to, your call, basically. Um, package templates, I think, has a mode for setting up documenter.jl. Uh, but Honestly, just check for yourself um, in the interactive mode of the templating engine, right? Um, do plots still work when you SSH to a machine? Yes, they do. Um, there might be some cases where um, the communication that's set up between you know, an interactive plot pane element and the Julia process won't work, because um, usually those work with sockets, and um, that's sometimes a bit uh, difficult to forward properly via SSH. But um, let's say dump plots, so non-interactive plots should work fine in all cases. Yes, definitely. Any uh, any not super um, advanced feature of the extension works fine via SSH, yes. <clears throat> um, yes, write code, loaded, and run tests is at least my workflow. Um, you can call it test-driven development if you write the tests first and then you know iterate on your code until your tests pass, basically. Uh, yes, you can have multiple modules in a package. That's no problem. But the top-level module is um, required to have the same name as your package. Uh, yes, I think you mm -mm -mm. can I start an external REPL and automatically activate the environment in the folder open in VS Code. Yes. Um, you can do that. Although I don't quite understand the question, honestly. Um, if you start Julia with a dash dash, so if you do uh, Jul Julia dash dash project equals dot, then that will automatically in, um, activate the you know environment in that directory for you. Package templates in Dr. Watson aren't very related at all, but I don't know too much about Dr. Watson, so. Um, OK, so we are exactly on time, I think. Um, to know if I should talk about um, about internals for a bit. If anyone's interested in that, feel free to stick around, I guess. Um, if not, then either someone will cut me off or, uh, I don't know, I'll talk to no one in a second. Um, but yeah. Um, if you're just interested in using VS Code, then feel free to drop off, I suppose. <clears throat> OK, so internals. Um, in the introduction, I briefly talked about how VS Code is, um, or how alongside VS Code, people, oh, Microsoft rather, not people. I mean, people too, but you know what I mean. 
Um, okay, that was my camera shutting off, unfortunately. I'll just move to this so people don't have to look at the weird um, freeze frame of my face. But um, yeah, so alongside um, VS Code, Microsoft introduced the language server protocol. And um, as the name kind of suggests, it um, specifies a protocol for talking between language servers and language clients. The language server in our case is a Julia process running um, code that will allow you, allow us to um, analyze your code and the language client in this case is VS Code, right? The um, Whenever you use any of these features in VS Code, like you know hovering over a function, that sends a request to the language server and the language server returns whatever you see here. So that's statically computed from your current environment. Um, in fact, um, yeah, many of the more advanced features in VS Code require a language server. So um, you could, for example, uh, let's see. Um, so for example, renaming stuff, I'm not sure if this is gonna fail horribly, but um, if you press F2, you can rename things in a um, language aware way. So if we want to rename this, then I would, or rather uh, rename the struct here, then I would expect that to also rename um, the constructed on here, right? And that worked fine. And this is not a simple um, find replace operation. <clears throat> that looks for a custom struct and you know replaces all occurrences of that. Instead, it calls the language server. The language server has a um, representation of your uh, code, and it's not basically an abstract syntax tree like um, what Julia code normally is lower to, but instead it's a concrete syntax tree, and that's generated by cstparser.jl that runs over all code in your, over all Julia code in your um, workspace. And um, after that, we have a representation of your code that's, that can actually be converted into um, Julia expressions, but also carries alongside with it um, other information that's not present in the abstract syntax tree. So for example, it can tell you where, um, you know, um, in a in a file you are in the sense of um, you know a line and a column. The abstract syntax tree disregards or doesn't contain that information. It also doesn't contain any white space and so on. So that's why we need an abstract syntax tree instead of an AST. Um, and yeah, basically all of the functionality um, you get in VS Code that's not interactive um, is derived from that. <clears throat> For packages, we also have this uh, symbol server, which um, basically loads your package and will um, ask the Julia runtime which symbols it defines and which um, doc strings it defines and so on and so forth. That's um, not a very clean solution and we are trying to move away from that, but the current release still you know, has that symbol server functionality. Hopefully we'll get something out before JuliaCon that does away with that. And we'll hopefully also cut down drastically on the initially, initialization time of the language server, except, uh, especially in big environments, many packages and so on. Um, <clears throat> I think, um, I won't really go into many of the language server protocol features. You can just check them out at, um, let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, just Google for it, right? Um, there's a spec for it. It has a bunch of things. Uh, the language, Julia language server doesn't um, implement all of these many, many, many um, requests and notifications, but fairly large subset of them, I think. Um, and um, this uh, spec is, or well, yeah, basically the spec is very powerful in the sense that it allows for most um, editing needs anyone could want, right? 
Um, there are language clients in um, Vim and Emacs and Sublime Text, for example, that work decently well with um, the Julia language server. Uh, there were recently a few threads on Discourse about people who actually got all of that to work fine. Uh, so check that out if you want. Unfortunately, documentation for anything language server, language server protocol related on our end is somewhere between bad and non-existent. So it's very hard to um, use yourself, I would say. The VS Code extension, luckily, um, you know, <laughs> works around the documentation issue by uh, being written by the same people. So no one actually needs to uh, read documentation to figure out what's going on on the other end. <clears throat> but yeah. Then um, another exciting thing that goes on um, inside of, or well, between the extension and Julia is um, the companion to the LSP, and that's called the DAP, the Debug Adapter Protocol, which is, um, well, as the name already says, um, a protocol for uh, communication between um, VS Code or any client and a um, debugging server. And that's actually how um, debugging in Whoa. Okay. Um, I think my laptop's dying. Well, interesting. I will just um, figure out what's going on with that. 